for those of you who are online, I believe that you are uh, enjoying yourselves where you are, and I want to trust God that uh, his faithfulness is abounding in your habitations or in your car or wherever you are. This is the beauty of our modern times. We can join service from anywhere we are. And by the grace of God, the Lord will continue to walk in us and through us in diverse ways in Jesus' name. And so I want to just encourage you to stay connected. It can be easy to be distracted at home. And um, I want to just say, you know, remain connected to the service. Some of you can project these services to your TVs, your smart TVs, it's probably better you do so because you command some more space by just using your mobile device. So if you can, you can do that and um, God bless you. But we want to bless God for how he's helped us in this course of this series. We started uh, this series uh, about five weeks ago on the uh, very, very first Sunday of the year 2021. We started the series of entering supernatural overflow. And by the grace of God, we have come to the fifth and ultimate session of this series on the theme of prayer. What I haven't done all along is to explain the inspiration behind the picture. I don't just take a picture for the sake of it. I designed these things myself, by the way. And uh, I just let the Holy Spirit tell me what it is that is coming together in it. And I, any. I look for as many, some of the pictures I took myself, not this one, but um, in some cases I use pictures I've taken myself or just objects that demonstrate what I believe God wants us to focus on. Now, you can see one of the strongest birds depicted there. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago uh, in, the, in, the, in the bird uh, of the eagle. It's flying solo, well, that's one of the characteristics of the eagle. Flies in a very adverse situation. You can see snowy mountains. You can hardly see any sign of life. But here is this animal, this very powerful animal, going soaring higher than all the mountain heights, uh, blazing all the storms, and uh, right there, even on, in such a place. Now, this depicts the supernatural in a way, it typifies what we are in the supernatural. The word supernatural means that there is something that supersedes the natural, something that is uncommon, something that takes an element of the divine to make happen what you need. So we have looked at these things that God has given to us when we pray and when we thank God and live lives of thanksgiving, it helps us to stay in the presence of God, contacting of him the supernatural powers, the same with praise, the same with worship. And the same with last week, we looked at testimonies and how powerful these can be. We said testimonies are just like the first three things. They are like full of thanksgiving, praise to God, worship to God. But over and above that, testimonies involve us talking to others about the doings of the Lord. And so it is important that we understand this. Now, the theme of prayer is the sort of ultimate session deliberately because it pulls everything together. Every one form of things that we have discussed uh, in terms of thanksgiving, praise, worship, testimonies are various tools in the hands of God to help us to enter this supernatural uh, overflow and live in the realms thereof. However, prayer is the key. Prayer is what helps us to keep that communication language going. I believe everybody knows that the we, the, 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 the secret to uh, a relationship flourishing and advancing uh, effectively is how best communication is handled in such a relationship. If there is no communication, there is always a breakdown from one party to the other of both ways. And so we emphasize communication quite a lot. And this is why we must understand that this ultimate session of prayer is not just for us to talk about prayer in the light sense. I believe every believer, everyone who is born again, understands prayer. We know what prayer is. It's one of the first things we learn that we have to do as Christians. So we know what prayer is. But I just want us to emphasize it today and also to look at the different types of prayer in terms of how God wants us to pray and to learn a few things that would help us to pray more effectively so that we can actually continue to enjoy this supernatural overflow. 
Prayer in itself is basically an act of talking to God. An act of talking to God. And I would like to say, preferably, an act of talking with God. Because when we talk to God, by faith, we believe that he talks back to us. Many believers always think that prayer is one way. We talk to God, but we don't take time in prayer to hear from God. Many times, God is willing to talk, and he doesn't have to respond the way we expect, but he's always responding anyway. So we need to train ourselves and to understand how prayer communication works. Prayer is not just a meditation or some kind of a passive life or passive reflection. Those things have their place. We can meditate on the word of God, think about the word of God, and, and, and celebrate it in our hearts, but that is not necessarily prayer. Prayer addresses God, speaks to God over matters of life. It is the communication of our soul with the God who created the soul himself. It is the communication of our inner being with the spirit of the Lord himself. So prayer is a primary way for us as believers in Jesus Christ to communicate our emotions, our feelings, the things that are our infirmities, the things that are our weaknesses, the times of our tiredness and our weariness. We pray by these things. Now prayer can be audible. But prayer can also be silent. Prayer can be by an individual. Prayer can, can be in a corporate setting. Every kind of prayer has its place. Prayer can be formal. Prayer can be informal. What I mean by formal is you can set out to say, now I want to pray or let us pray. Those are formal prayers. But there are many times we pray informally. We pray spontaneously. We pray. And any time you talk to God, you are praying. This is why you must understand that you need to train yourself to know how to pray effectively every time. Because just like in a relationship, you don't always plan when you talk with your spouse or even your relationship with your parents or children to parents to children or children to parents. You don't always have to plan out your communications. There are times that there are spontaneous talk. Things are happening and there is a need to have a talk about it. That's the same way prayer should be seen. However, we look at whether it is formal or informal, silent or open, open, uh, openly declared or whether it's by an imper uh, a person or in a congregation, we need to understand that prayer has to be done by faith. Prayer has to be offered in faith. We are not going to turn to it just yet, but in James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God that gives to all men liberally and does not withhold. But in verse 6, it says, But let that person ask in faith. Let him ask in faith, not doubting. Because anyone who doubts is like a wave of the sea, and let not that person think he can ever obtain anything from the Lord. So prayer is not just about going through the motions. I have seen many times where people pray and the motions are wonderful, fantastic, fantastic stuff. Display, acrobatic display and use of words that are heavy. But the very next minute after the prayer, everything they say shows that they don't even believe what they were praying. <laughs> it shows very clearly that they are in doubt of what they were praying about. So it's not about how professional you can become. And I tell you, when some people pray near you, you'll be intimidated. Very intimidated. Say, Lord God Almighty. <laughs> and you are just there trying to understand what this thing is about. But they talk. But then it is not, it's not if, if only that was what it was, then every prayer will be getting answered. Many prayers are answered today because they are not done in faith. They are done out of, out of doubt out of worry, out of anxiety, things that must not be mixed with prayer. And prayer must be in the name of the Lord Jesus. For believers, we don't just pray. We must pray in the name of the Lord. Jesus said in John 16, 23, he said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, whatever you ask the Father in my name, and he said, in my name, you shall cast out devils. In my name, in my name. So believers must, and this is what makes Christian prayer different from every other prayer. Every Christian prayer that does not end 
in the name of Jesus is a religious prayer. Prayer must end in the name of Jesus for believers. We must understand this. And it is so important that we understand because it is that name that God has highly exalted and has now been made the name above all names. And at the name of Jesus, what happens? Every knee must bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. God himself conferred that authority in that name. So we must understand that the name of Jesus is very, very important for us as Christians. And we don't pray it in our power. We pray it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26, you can write that down also. The Bible says that he helps our infirmities. In that whilst we do not know how to pray or what we ought to pray, that he himself, the Holy Spirit, intercedes for us in groanings that cannot be uttered. And so it is very important that we understand this. I like something J.C. Lambert said about Christian prayer. He said it is the prayer addressed to God as the Father, in the name of Christ as the mediator and through the enabling grace of the Holy Spirit. It is the prayer, Christian prayer is the prayer offered to God as the Father. For a Christian, God is not just God, who is God over all, which he is, but he is also our Father. The Bible says we can therefore, therefore cry, Abba, Father. So we come to God as you go to your earthly father, as you would go to your earthly father and discuss and have conversations. That's the same way we must come to God. We come to God, reverencing him as the father. But the ticket that we have to come to the father is the mediating power of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he came to pay for when he became flesh and he dwelt amongst us and he died and rose again then gave us free access to this father. Jesus said in John 14 verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except by me. So J.C. Lambert was very spot on when he said, we come to the father. God as the Father, through the mediating power of Christ, the Son, obviously, and then the enabling grace of the Holy Spirit helping us to pray. The Holy Spirit will help us to pray, either granting us understanding or directly praying for us in tongues or, or languages that we may not understand. Prayer is very important. God said to pray. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. I'm just giving you some scriptures. to. If we were to take this series in depth, we will go over it for the next two months. We'll still be on it. Prayer is so key. God said to pray. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land. To paraphrase it. We must pray. Jesus came again in Matthew chapter 6. He said, when you pray, you say like this. You say like this. Jesus did not say if you pray. He said when you pray. Jesus taught us to pray and he showed us how to pray. In fact, to the point whereby the disciples saw him praying and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. I believe, believers, I believe as Christians we must understand that knowing how to pray is something that we must learn consistently. Particularly when we measure our lives as we grow. Don't let your prayer life remain where it is for too long. There is always room to improve in prayer. Prayer is an art. Prayer takes a skill. Prayer involves improvement. Prayer involves increase. It involves understanding. The disciples had walked with Jesus for some time before they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. They never asked him to teach them to preach. They never asked him to teach them to do anything else. They just said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Every other thing they could watch and just follow and just take instructions from him. But when it came to prayer, they said, teach us because there is a technicality about prayer. There is a way about prayer. There is something that a believer must understand about prayer to make it effective. When Paul and all the other apostles came later on, they told us the importance of prayer. Paul particularly, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and also in verse 17, he said, pray without ceasing. He said, pray without ceasing. Remember, we read verse 16 a lot. He said, rejoice evermore. Rejoice always. Rejoice evermore. Then verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. 
So the Bible enjoins us to pray. And prayer is not an old-fashioned thing that happened in time past. We are of a faith generation that believe that we have more understanding and more revelation today than it was in the days of old, which is partially true because till we see Jesus, knowledge will continue to grow and increase and understanding will continue to expand. No doubt about that. However, we must understand that we have lost some of the ancient landmarks by the side in the name of modernization. We find it very difficult to pray in our generation. We are the busiest generation ever. We have devices and things that should help us make life easier, but in many cases they have come to complicate lives for us because they are more distracting than before. Things now that can easily take us off course, even in praying, we are praying and we have text messages coming in. We have emails coming in and we have communication going on. Some of us are praying and we are on other meetings just because we have to fit them together. That is how busy our generation has become. But you see, we must understand this, that no matter how busy we, come, we become, there is no modern and improved version of God. The same God that has said my people must pray is still asking for prayer today. We must understand this. And so, the subject of prayer is not an old-fashioned thing. Many churches today find it difficult. In the last 20, 30 years, churches find it much more difficult to organize proper, and I want to use the word carefully, proper prayer meetings. They organize so-called miracle healings. They organize so-called uh, 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 revival meetings and so many things. But when you drill down to what is done in those, many of those meetings, it doesn't teach people to pray. It only gives handouts to people. It tells people good things. And so we have believers who have gone on for five years, ten years. They don't even know how to make basic prayer. They cannot even pray by themselves for 15 minutes. But they've been in every meeting by everybody ever organized. That is not the will of God. Now, I'm not against revival meetings. I'm not against so-called miracle meetings. But if we understand the place of prayer and the word, like the first apostle said, we will have need, less need for some of those kind of meetings. If we understand, the Bible says, the apostle said, look, 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 look. There's much distraction here in Acts chapter 6. He said, but let us give ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. The ministry of the word and prayer. The more we can get the word and prayer sorted, the less we have challenges. That's why it came to a time when James was going to talk. He said, is anyone sick among you? Because prayer and word going together automatically has its way of driving out the negativities. That people go and wait for two hours to be prayed for in a line in a revival meeting. If more believers can know how to pray, we will have less time organizing revival meetings that are for believers. How can we be organizing revival meetings? There are 100,000 people gathered and 80,000 are believers. That is not a revival meeting. That is a holiday of Christians. <laughs> if we have 100,000 unbelievers gathered together, ministered to by only 1,000 properly saved believers. You will see 100,000 people saved. And then that multiplies like that and multiplies. But what we have been doing over the years is gathering believers. They gather in this meeting today. The next meeting is Benny Hinn. God bless him. I thank God for his life. I followed him for almost 30 years now. I respect the great servant of God. And then the next meeting is that one. The next meeting they fly to, to, to Shiloh and go and see Bishop Oedeko. The next meeting they are with uh, 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 Kenneth Copeland for Southwest Believers Convention. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. That is not the intention of God. I am not against those meetings, but we must understand, you as a Christian has a responsibility to learn how to pray and pray and pray. If your church doesn't teach you how to pray and force you to pray, it's not helping you. It's not helping you. Churches must learn, must teach believers how to read the word and understand for themselves and pray and know how to pray for themselves. This is what is going to prepare that church that Christ is coming to rapture. Christ is coming for a church without a spot or wrinkle. Christ is not coming to organize another revival meeting. He's not coming to organize another miracle healing service. 
No, he is coming for those who have been doing that and converting many. Doing that and converting many till he comes. That is what he's coming to meet. Every one of us must understand this. And I know that it is not a fanciful thing to talk about things like this in our day and age. It's not. It's not. It's not what people like to hear. But like I did with my children, and every parent will do with their children, if food is good for you to eat, whether you spit it out or you don't take it, you will be forced to take it until you can grow by yourself and start eating it. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you leave children, they will just eat biscuits and sweet and Haribo and all the bowls. That is all they will be eating. Put vegetable there, they will spit it out. Put uh, proper things there, carrot, they will spit it out. They don't want those things. They want things that are just sweet, 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 sweet. That is how many believers are. They just want the sweet, 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 sweet. Meanwhile, God wants us to move away from there. So my emphasis today, friends, is that we must pray. We must learn to pray. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, is the one I would like us to first project here today. So therefore I exhort, first of all, First Timothy 2, 1, thank you. First of all, that all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. I exhort, I challenge, I encourage that these things be made for all men. This is Paul. It is very important we understand that we are commanded to pray. I will quickly take us through some prayer forms that depict these supplications, intercessions, all manners of prayers, and thanksgiving. These are very important. The first one, I've talked about it a little, but I want to mention it, is the prayer of faith. Say with me, the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith helps us to enjoy divine life. This can be divine health, divine wealth, anything divine, divine promotion, divine interventions. Now, because they are all prayers, most of the time, you can use different prayers to do different things. But first understand that there is a prayer of faith, and primarily the examples of the prayer of faith we see in the scripture is that it allowed people to enjoy divine life, especially divine health or divine healing. James chapter 5 verse 15 says, and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The prayer of faith is one that must involve the faith of the one praying and the one being prayed for. If anybody is praying for themselves, they must pray by faith. If anybody is praying for somebody else, they must pray by faith. And the person being prayed for must also receive it by faith. The prayer of faith needs a complete demonstration of faith every time. Remember my favorite story of the book of Acts chapter 3? When Peter met that man at Gate Beautiful, the Bible says that man looked expecting to receive. When Peter said, silver and gold, I do not have. But such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. The two faiths connected to each other, and there it was. In John chapter 4, a man called, just simply known as uh, 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 a man with a, a, a sick child, came to Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus said, he, he said to Jesus, he said, my son is sick. And Jesus looked at the man. He said, go your way. Your servant is healed. And the Bible says that man left believing in the word of the master. The prayer of faith. And when, when we understand the prayer of faith, we also understand why we need to be mature as Christians. Many times believers don't even understand that when a word is given, when a word is being declared, many times prayers of faith are declared in the context of those things. But many times, believers will wait through such meetings only to wait for prayer at the end. Because something has conditioned their mind to say, okay, that is the word. And after the word, then there will be prayer. Many times, the word contains all the prayer. Hallelujah. The word declared by faith is prayer. That's why Luke 5.17 says, as Jesus was teaching, the power of God was present to heal. This is why believers must understand these things. Now, when I say these things, it always looks as if I'm against, you know, those uh, Pentecostal uh, uh, and charismatic things that we do. I'm not against them. I've done them plenty. 
<laughs> before I saw that many times we are wasting our time. God overlooked in the days of ignorance. But when he opened our eyes to see that many of the displays and the things we are doing are no long, are not important, we all saw the power. I find that in many meetings, when the word is going, you must be doing two things. Listen to the word that is being preached and also agree by faith with the prayer that is being made. A lot of the word has declarations in them that are prayers of faith. Jesus did not stop the meeting and say, hey, guys, there is a sick child here. And I know he's done that before, but he didn't do it in this occasion. He didn't stop the meeting to say there is a sick child here. Now everybody, all disciples, Peter, John, James, let's, let's, begin to, let's begin to intercede now. Let's begin to intercede so that the boy can be healed. And then after he said that, he now said, okay, go. No, no, no. He just said, go your way. Your servant is healed. That's the prayer. And the man agreed. That is even better. That is even less. There was even a better one with a man called the centurion in Mark chapter 8. This man, the Bible says, he came to Jesus. He said, my servant is, he is sick. My servant is sick. Jesus said, okay, I will go and heal him. He said, that one said, no, no, you don't need to come. What did he say? Did he say pray? Did he say pray for me? Speak the word only. <laughs> Speak the word only. Speak the word only. Because he recognized that that is the word that became flesh. That is the power. That is the one that has been given a name above every other name. When that word is declared, every prayer is made. He says, speak the word only and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I have not seen so great a faith. Not even in Israel. We almost understand, friends, that the prayer of faith is so powerful. When you don't believe in the person praying, there is nothing they can do for you. If you don't believe, if you know you are not going to believe in somebody's prayer, don't allow them to pray for you. You are wasting your time and you are wasting their time. Prayer of faith means that you believe. The Bible says if anyone is sick, let him call on the elders and let them lay their hands and pray for him. Anointing his head with oil in James 5 verse 14. And he said that, and the prayer of faith, verse 15, will save the sick. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Hallelujah. That is why before Jesus will pray at any place, he will ask them, do you believe I'm, about, I'm, I'm able to do this? At the tombstone of Lazarus, he asked them, he said, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe I'm able to do this? Because it is what you believe that you get. Hallelujah. So the prayer of faith is the first one. And every one of us must learn how to pray by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Pump yourself up with the word of God. All these examples I've given, they are things that I remember every time. When I remember how Daniel prayed when he was being persecuted and how he prayed with boldness, it gives me assurance that no matter anybody that is ganging up and wants to put me in trouble, if I pray like he did, I will get the same results he did. When I remember the boldness and the audacity of David in front of Goliath and praying and saying that the Lord will give me this uncircumcised Philistine, I am bold against the challenges of my life as well. If you don't intoxicate yourself with the word of God, I use the word intoxicate in quote, if you don't intoxicate yourself with the word of God and the spirit of God, you will be afraid of the words of man. You must let the word of God always rise up on your inside. When you hear anything from outside, what is coming out of your inside? Are you responding the same way or are you responding with that which you know about the God that you serve? The prayer of faith is a non-negotiable. Every believer must learn this. In this church, our mission is to raise people. It's not to pamper people is to raise people of purity, power, purpose, and prosperity. Each of them walking in the fullness of those things. It's not to pop people. It's not to keep co 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 coaxing people and just, 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 just garnishing it and just pushing them along. Now, I know that there are people who grow from stage to stage. That is fine. But if you are in this church and you've spent one year, two years, and you cannot pray for yourself, it is nobody's fault but yours. Because there is every room for you to join prayer. And you see, many people think that the things of God can be learned by reading it or by, try, by, by just wishing it. You don't, learn, you don't know how to pray by reading how to pray. You know how to pray by praying. You know how to pray by praying. You study it, then you pray it. You study it, and you pray it. That is how you grow in prayer. That's how you go in the things of God. 
Have you ever seen a preacher who said, I just believe that I'm so anointed and he has never preached to one person? I'm heavily anointed. The power of God is always here. <laughs> and he has never preached to one person. That is not, <laughs> he's just wasting his time. In this kingdom, you demonstrate growth and you grow by praying and doing the things that you ought to do. So the prayer of faith is non-negotiable. Number two, the prayer of agreement. The prayer of agreement. We know about these prayer forms, but I want us to know. When we pray in agreement, it helps us to corporately effect change. Show me a couple that know how to agree on a matter. I will show you people who get things cheaply, easily, easily. Show me a people who will be struggling as a couple, sadly, I will, I, 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 will, I will let you know that they have no agreement in their prayer. When you agree, even in the church setting, when there is agreement between people, they take delivery and change situations that the enemy was meaning for bad very easily. I've seen this thing since I was a seven-year-old. I've told you this story many times. I saw the church come together, pray for a man, an elder of the church that I was born into, who was lost for about seven months, six months. They found him in the seventh month. But we prayed every week. I was so young, I was joining the adults to pray because I followed my father to church. And when they group people, they used to do it every Wednesday evening. Then they would group them in about ten groups, six, six people. They, would, they sat down and prayed. This prayer point was there. And I would sit with them as well. Till they started allowing me to pray. I never left the group. Me to whatever I can pray, I pray. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I remember clearly that it was one of the first signs I saw in life that when people truly pray, things can change. This was 1976, 77, Nigeria. You can imagine how backward things were then. No communication, no mobile phone. You know even landline too, that was working, so there's no issue of mobile phone. How do you contact such a person? And somebody found him 700 kilometers away in northeast Nigeria. Miracle when people pray. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, the Bible says, but constant prayer was offered. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by who? The church. Prayer of agreement. Herod was intending to kill him after Easter. The church said, no, you can't have this one. You have had one. We did not pray in time. You had one, but you can't have this one. And forcefully, when they prayed, the angel went into the prison and opened up the, the door. Nobody rescued Peter, except God himself. Nobody broke the chains of Paul and Silas except God himself because the Bible says Paul and Silas, they prayed. Paul and Silas, they, they were agreeing people. I used to say Acts chapter 16 is very important. When you read Acts chapter 17 and 15 and you see why Paul did not want to go with John Mark at that point and they, did, they had to separate. John Mark went with Barnabas and Silas went with Paul. It's when you get to Acts 16 that you will understand that God was preparing Paul for a partner they will agree. At that point in time, John Mark became very useful later on to Paul because he talked about him to Timothy. But you know something? At that point in time, John Mark was a very fearful man. He was a very fearful man. He, he, he ran away from Paul at a point. So Paul did not want to go with him again. <laughs> imagine, imagine them bound together in that prison. That is Mark and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Paul. Imagine them bound together, join Adini. Paul is saying, let us pray, let's trust God. He said, I told you. Mark will say, I told you. You always look for trouble. I told you, you should have left all those people. Don't be saying these things. Hey, no, just leave. let's go. Jesus said that we can always dust our feet and go to the next town. <laughs> Why do you like trouble like this? So there won't be agreement. <laughs> so God knew what was ha going to happen. So he took along a man that will agree with him. And when they both agreed and they prayed, not only were their bands broken, everyone who was also in the prison, <laughs> everybody was also saved. Hallelujah. The prayer of agreement is key. If you are here and you are a couple or you are under the sound of my voice, you need counseling if you don't agree with your wife. Why did you marry your wife? Why did you marry your wife? Why did you marry your husband? And every day you can't agree to pray? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? The power you have together to pray together will ward off a lot of evil around you. The devil knows it. That's why you, you don't want to agree. He said, me, I just don't like what he's saying, even the way he prays. I, eh. <laughs> it's not about the way he prays or the way she prays. Just agree. If one person likes loud praying and the other person likes soft praying, that's how my parents were. Do you know? My mother liked very long prayer. 
my father, very short, he will just give you five minutes and that is it. So all their life, my father will do his prayer first. <laughs> because his own is quick. <laughs> That's how they agreed. My father will do his own, finish in five minutes, then my mother will start. She will first warm up, very warm up. <laughs> my father will just be there, carry on. That's no problem, guys. <laughs> they've been like that for, they've been praying like that for more than 60 years of their marital life. 60 years. You just agree and find a format that works. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but seriously, agreement is power. Matthew 18, he said, if two of you, just two of you, shall agree as touching anything on earth. He said, my father will give it to you. Even from the heavens, it shall be done for you, even here on earth. It is important to learn how to pray in agreement. Number three, prayer of what we call supplication. Basically, a prayer of request. I put them together as supplication and thanksgiving. Even though supplication can be on its own, thanksgiving can be on its own. But in Philippians 4, 6, it tells us how to bring them together. If you want to overcome anxiety, you want to overcome fear, you need to know how to put supplication and thanksgiving together. It said, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. This gives us personal access to God. Verse 7, we don't need to turn to it, says that, and the peace of God, which rule, will rule and reign in your heart. The peace of God. When you know how to supplicate and be thankful, you will always live at peace. People will see you and think that you don't have challenges at all. People will see you and think that you are not going through the things that they are also going through because you learn how to talk to God and also how to be thankful. You see, when you pray and you know how to supplicate, but what you do is murmuring and complaining, it invalidates your prayer. You cannot mix fear, murmuring, complaining, anger, bitterness with any form of supplication. It doesn't work. Always mix it with thanksgiving. The Bible says, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So the prayer of supplication and thanksgiving gives us personal access to God and to his peace. Many people are troubled in our world today. We need to know how to be thankful. The fact that you are alive to be able to offer a prayer should be enough for you to give thanks. And when you go before the Lord, thank God for God. When you want to pray about your job, maybe you are being treated harshly at work or you are being sidelined or maligned and you just feel that you want to talk to God, first start by thanking God for that job. It works wonders. Thank God for that job. Thank God that God put you in that job. Thank God that he has kept you there for the one month, one year, ten years, whatever you've been there. Thank God for it. Thank God for it. And then just present your request to God. You will watch how God will work in diverse ways for you in such cases. And it works in everything. You want to pray for a child? To, be, to, to, to do right, to improve in their studies, to do what they're doing. Thank God for them. Thank God for the gift of life. Look at everything you can think of about the child that is good. Use it to thank God because there will be something. There will be something. The joy you had when you heard that they were being born, when they were being conceived. The joy that you had that the day they were born in, and you, you held them for the first time in your hand and so on and so forth. Whatever it is, there is always something to be thankful for. It helps you to know how to request from God. Many believers just bombard heaven with requests. No thanksgiving, no hallowing of the Father. They say, let us pray now. Father, I need money tomorrow because I have no need, I have no uh, milk in the house. I have no fees, uh, no money to pay the fees of uh, this and that bill and that bill. Father, I know you can do this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> that is not prayer at all. <laughs> that is complaint and anger. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a ministry of prayer. That is a ministry of anger. You have only gone to express your vexation to God and you have left his presence before he can even say, my son, come back, you have gone. You are... Say, Father, do it now in Jesus' name. Ah, no. <laughs> you have not prayed. Come before him. Say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. Even Jesus will say, Father, I thank you that you hear me always. Learn from him. The Bible says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. So be always thankful when you do your supplication. This prayer is one. The next one is one that we, we undermine a lot. The prayer of worship. The prayer of worship. This prayer, you don't ask for anything. 
You just go and worship. We talked about worship a couple of weeks ago. You just go. Oh, worship is different from praise and thanksgiving because, you see, in praise, you are exonerating God. You are talking about, uh, exalting God for who he is. You are saying, Lord, this is who you are, and I thank you for who you are in thanksgiving. You do all those things. But you see, worship, you go before the Lord and say, I worship you. I reverence you. I give you glory. You are the God of all gods, and I respect you. I give you all that is within me. All that I am exalts you. When you pray like that and pray like that, very easily done when you are in praise and worship. When the worship leader says, now you just talk to God. That is your moment to pray, the prayer of worship. Don't use it to look around and say, ah, what is the time now? Why is this person wasting our time? Take the next song. Take the next song. <laughs> Take the next song. Take the next song. No, 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 no. The person is giving you an opportunity to pray the prayer of worship. Many times you receive inspiration like that. Many times you hear from God in those moments of just going and saying, Lord, I reverence you. I join the saints of God today and I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you worship. Many times we get divine direction like that. Just whilst you are speaking, he will say to you, that matter about your parents, this is what you will do. That matter about your wife, this is what you will do. Because before you came to the meeting, you had other plans. But as you were worshipping, you say, no, not that plan, but this is what you will do. That matter about your husband, your child, whatever it is. I've told you many times I have received big engineering solutions. Not once, not twice, not three times. In the place of worship. Things that have troubled my mind for a couple of weeks, thinking, how will it be at times? How will it be? Because it's a bit of a complex situation. And you read things. You've done all the things you should do as a professional, but nothing is coming through. In the place of worship, many times as I lift up my hands, as the worship leader says, now go ahead. And you can do it on your own as well. It doesn't have to be in a corporate setting. But there is power in that of a corporate setting as well. As I lift up my hands and I say, Lord, I thank you. You are a good God. I bless your holy name. All that is within me, my faculties, I surrender to you. You say, now listen, my son. That matter, this is what you will do. And as soon as I go, I check it out. It works 100% of the time. Never failed. Never failed. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 13, we saw how, as they ministered to the Lord, the Holy Spirit came and said, separate to me, <laughs> Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Can you imagine that? They were ministering to the Lord. They didn't know what next to do. But the Holy Spirit just came. When you worship God, he sends things down. When you worship God, he sends divine direction. He sends divine solutions. He, sends, he, he, he intervenes in the matters of your life. Things that are important. He, he baptizes you with favor. Many times he may not speak, but he clothes you with something that when the next people to see you will see you, they will just want to act for you. And they will just want to do things for you. In the name of Jesus. The prayer of worship is so important and we must learn how to pray it every time we have the opportunity. At times you can do it in your car when you are alone. Just be worshiping God. Just be driving and worshiping God. And let God help you. Number six. Abi, number five. What have I said? One, two, three. I'm not numbering it here. So that's number five. Number five. The prayer of what? Consecration. The prayer of consecration. That's the next thing. The prayer of consecration. This is the one we pray when we need spiritual strength. Believers don't usually agree that at times we feel dry. There are times you just feel very dry, no matter your anointing. <laughs> One day Benny Hinn said he wanted to pray. He didn't even know how to pray. This was many years ago. He called his wife. This was many years ago in the 90s. He said, honey, please pray for me. Honestly, I don't even know how to pray now. <laughs> it can hit anybody. You just feel dry. You feel expunged. You feel that you have given up everything. And somehow, for that temporary moment, it looks as if this is the time you pray the prayer of consecration. This is the time you pray the prayer of consecration. Jesus prayed it in Matthew chapter 26, verse 13. And the prayer of consecration is simple. Just pray for the will of God to be done in your life. The Bible says he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass, pass from me. 
Say, but nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Anytime you say, Lord, let your will be done. That's why Jesus put it in the prayer format he taught the disciples. He said, pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Anytime, because God has given man the capacity to have free will. So anytime man says, I surrender that my free will to you, he's so excited. <laughs> he's so encouraged. Because it's what he loves. Not that he wants to control you, but he loves you so much that what he knows he has for you in heaven that you can't see, he knows only he can give it to you, but you are the one that holds the key. So when you say, Lord, this is tough, this is hard, but Lord, not my will, but let your will be done. Over time, I'll still tell you some testimonies about the month January 2018. January 2018, one of the darkest months I'd ever faced in my lifetime to date. It was not just physically dark. You know January can be very dark. <laughs> it was not just physically dark. Some of you may have an idea of some things I went through, but what you think you know is just a fraction of what I went through then. It was tough every day. I just kept on saying, Lord, let your will be done. Let your will be done. And every day I was receiving strength. I was receiving strength. And I find that the more we submit our will to his will, this is how we receive strength. It is called the prayer of consecration. You are asking God to sanctify you, to separate you unto himself again and walk in your life. In the name of Jesus. We can go on. The prayer of intercession. The prayer of intercession. This is another very important one. This is when we pray for others. We read it earlier in 2 Timothy 1, 2 verse 1. He said, I exhort first that all supplication and prayer intercessions be made for everyone and the giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2 says, for kings also and for those who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reference. Make prayers for others. This prayer helps us to help others. Believers must not be closed in. One of the powers that God gave to us is the ability to be able to pray for other people. Always use it. It is a gift. If you are to look at your challenges only on a daily basis, believe me, you will not see reason to pray for anybody. If you are always focused on yourself, me, myself, and I alone, when you want to pray, say, Father, I thank you, I, 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 me, myself, and me alone, only I, I, yeah, thank you, Lord, I, yes, me, yes, myself, and I, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> that is only about you every time. God wants you to talk about others. He wants you to also think about others. This is the prayer that we need to pray every time. He said, I challenge you that you pray for kings. This is why in this church we pray for the government of our country every week. In our morning prayers, we pray for the country, we pray for the government of the country, because it's not easy. Many people just open their mouth and talk against leaders, say, hey, oh, this politician, I don't know what, that Boris, what is Boris? Do you think it's an easy office? <laughs> it's not an easy office. Some of the decisions they take at times can be life-changing, and they know it's like the weight of, 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 the, of, of, a, of, of 60 million people put on a person. Because you know that if you sign something, it can lead to the death of many very easily. It's not easy. So he said, pray for kings. Pray for those in authority because they need your prayers. Pray for the fathers. Pray for the husbands. Pray for the mothers. They need your prayers. Pray for them. Pray for other people every time because it helps you to help others when you learn to pray this way. Hallelujah. The last prayer point I want to talk about is hardly ever talked about because it was more common in the Old Testament. But when the New Testament believers got a wind of it, they prayed it in the will of God. This is what is called the prayer of imprecation. Imprecation. It is like a prayer done in anger. This is the kind of prayer you will find in a lot of the Psalms. When the, when the Psalmist will say, Lord, destroy all my enemies. <laughs> Kill them all. <laughs> Hallelujah. But when Jesus came, he said, you know what? Pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Now, there are still many believers that pray those kind of prayers today. And I want you to understand that whilst we have enemies, Paul has told us, the scriptures have told us that we are no longer wrestling against flesh and blood, but against what? 
principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. This is what we fight against now. So we must always understand this. It is not so much of, now, my enemy die, my enemy die, my enemy die. That kind of prayer is old-fashioned, is, is Old Testament. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's Old Testament. The prayer you need now is Romans 8.31. If God be for us, who can be against me? So you just, all you need to pray is the presence of God. Pray the presence of God. So whatever those enemies are, however they are walking, they can never withstand that which you are now carrying. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, the Bible says they were threatening the believers. And they, they said to them, they, when they had prayed, they said, Lord, behold the threatenings of the people. They didn't pray, Lord, destroy all the people. Consume them with fire now, now, now. All the people threatening our peace here. No, they said, Lord, behold their threatenings. Just grant unto us boldness that we may speak your word. And the Bible says, and when they had prayed, verse 31, the place where they were assembled together was what? Shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they did what? Spoke the word of God with boldness. They spoke the word of God with boldness. So many times, what you need to pray is for God to help you to overcome the challenges. If somebody is threatening you at work and trying to make a mockery of your work, pray that God will give you supernatural results. Don't pray that God should kill them. Don't pray that God should remove them. You don't need all that kind of prayer. Just pray, Lord, give me supernatural results here. Help me here to overcome the forces that come against me. Grant me boldness to speak your word. And this is the commandment of the Lord today. The reason why David prayed the prayer he prayed was simply because David did not enjoy our order of salvation. David only had God, direct communication with the Father. So all he knew, there was no mediator, nothing. All he knew was Father, turn his counsel to foolishness. Lord, make that one mad that is working against me. <laughs> Destroy them in their own words. Let them eat their vomit. <laughs> It is there in the Bible. That's how he prayed. But that was his understanding because he knew that he, he needed help. But when Jesus came, Jesus said, you know what? I have already overcome for you. He said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have already overcome for you. Hallelujah. So you don't need to be asking for any enemy to die. It's a waste of time. <laughs> Just ask God to be on your side. If God be for you, who can be against you? Hallelujah. As I round this up now, I just want to quickly remind us, Pastor Moses read for us very quickly, I want to go through it in 1 Kings 18, verse 41. We want to learn from the story of Elijah. Elijah was a man who prayed, and we need to learn some things about his prayer. We read 1 Kings 18, verse 41 to 46. I just want to quickly touch on the first few verses of that. In verse 41, he said, Then Elijah said, Go up and eat, for there is the sound. Somebody say the sound. the sound. Not the abundance of rain just yet. There is the sound of the abundance of rain. Don't forget, there had been famine for three years. And now, God had given a word. The first thing I want you to know when you pray, I just want to tell you four things very quickly that you must learn about praying. Four, first thing is, know the will of God. Know the will of God. Elijah knew the will of God. There was famine, but he said, go and eat. There is a sound of the abundance of rain. The will of God is your power. It's your power base. 1 John 5, 14 says, this is the confidence that we have, that when we pray according to his will, he hears us. It helps us to speak his language, to speak his mind, and it gives us an assurance. If you don't know the will of God, that the will of God for your marriage is that two are better than one, and that he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, you will find it difficult to pray for your marriage to be healed. But when you know that that's the will of God, you have a target you are walking towards. He said, Behold, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. If you don't know that that's the will of God for you, you will find it difficult to pray for God to increase and, and bless the work of your hands. It is the will of God. So you are not going to beg for it. It is his will. It is his will. When you know that his will is for you to be in health and your health is challenged, when you are praying, you are strengthened in that prayer because it is his will. A, father, a child that knows the will of the father always finds it easy to get things from the father. Always finds it easy. 
I always say to children who are born in uh, second siblings or third siblings and are still not wise enough, I say they, are, they, they don't learn. I was a third child. I was looking at the mistake of all the people in front of me. <laughs> This one, all his, how he did not know how to ask, and he got flogged instead of getting one. <laughs> I didn't really repeat that. This one, the way my sister was, at times, when she was a teenager, she was just giving all of us trouble. The way she would do things, and everybody would be fighting her, I say, I don't want that kind of life. So I pitched myself in the middle. <laughs> I was just enjoying his wisdom. So you look at things, you look at the will of God, look at when you understand that this is the father you have, his will. Elijah said that there is the sound of the abundance of rain. I know that his rain is coming. Number two, verse 42. He says, so Ahab went and ate and drank, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Number two, pray according to that will. You know the will of God? Then you must pray. It is not enough to know the will of God. Many believers can quote the will of God, but are they praying towards it? Jesus said, you must pray it. He said, pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Elijah said, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Then he went and bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. We are not wasting our time every day in this church, Monday to Friday, when we pray for one hour every day. At times praying the same prayer point. We are not wasting our time. We are bowing our knees, our head between our knees technically and saying, Lord, let your will be done. Let our marriages continue to be healed. Let our children do well. Let the land be healed. We are praying the will of God. If not for prayer, the will of God can never come to pass. If Jesus said we need to pray so that that will that is in heaven manifests on earth, we don't have a choice. We need to know how to keep praying according to the will of God. Then number three, verse 43, he said, And he said to his servant, Go up now and look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. Verse 44. There is nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. Number three point is to watch and keep praying persistently. There is another eighth prayer type that we did not talk about. It's called the prayer of importunity. Persistent prayer. Our modern day faith teaching has almost shown that prayer of importunity is like a prayer of lack of faith. No. Elijah, you can't contest Elijah's faith. But for him to go seven times, it means he knew that there is a place with persistence. You go again. You go again. You prayed. That result did not improve for the child. You go again. You prayed. The healing did not seem to have happened. You go again. There is nothing wrong. You are not acting in unbelief as long as you believe that it will happen. You are only in unbelief if you don't believe it will happen. But if you believe it will come to pass, it's just like the church we've been talking about and the things God has shown me and I keep declaring every time. I pray about it every time. We pray about it every time because I believe it will happen. And we must believe it will happen. Hallelujah. The Bible says, he said to him, go again. Go again. Go again. And then in verse 44, he said, then it came to pass. Hallelujah. He said, then it came to pass the seventh time. The seventh time is the time of perfection in God's hands. You see, if you want things to happen in God's timing, you need to wait for the seventh time. I'm not saying seven as in number seven, but the time of perfection. When I was very young and I saw that I'll finish university early, that by the time I was 19 and a half, 20, I would have graduated. I said, Lord, I want to marry now so that when I'm 40, my first child will be 20 years old exactly. I will celebrate our birthday together. <laughs> God said, okay, I've had you. <laughs> so any woman that just say Jesus, that I say, come, let's marry. <laughs> just come and say Jesus around, I say, come. Are you, you, you marry? <laughs> I was young. I just wanted to get it over with quickly. But God knew that all those kind of people I was carrying about that time <laughs> and the journey ahead of me, none of them will fit. So when I gave up, I said, okay, whatever you want to do, I'm not even marrying again. <laughs> then he said, okay, now I know that you are ready for me to do. <laughs> there is always a perfect time with God. Perfect time. You can't beat that time. 
You can't. Don't think you know better than God. In fact, don't let it cross your mind. You are praying. You are not seeing it. Keep praying because it is his will. Keep praying it. Keep praying it. Keep praying it like Elijah. Elijah said, go again. Go again. Go again. And then suddenly, the Bible says, when the man came back and said, I see a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. He said, go up. Say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down. At times, what you will see is not the whole manifestation, but the sign. Keep looking out for that sign. You are praying for that child to do well. You are praying that those grades will improve. Don't wait for all of it to improve at once before you say God has done it. See the mathematics going from D to C and say that is the sign. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> say that is the sign. See, see the English going from B, coming to an A. Say that is the sign. That is the sign. Hallelujah. Whatever the sign is, you're waiting, you're trusting God for the fruit of the womb. And the woman says, honey, I think I've missed it this month. I've missed it. You know, I can't find it this month. That is the sign. Don't say we'll wait till two months before we celebrate. Start celebrating. That is the sign. Hallelujah. That is the sign. That is the sign. The man said, it's a cloud as small as a man's hand. That is nothing compared to what would bring the real rain. But he said, go now. That is it. Go now. That is it. Hallelujah. And finally, he celebrated the answered prayer, verse 45. The Bible says, now it happened in the meantime, verse 45. It happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds. From one little sign, suddenly the whole sky becomes clouds and wind. And there was what? I didn't hear you. And there was what? And there was what? You can see it on the screen, I believe. And there was what? Heavy rain. Keep celebrating the small sign and the heavy rain will soon be here. In the name of Jesus, it is well with you. Let's give the Lord a big hand of praise. He's worthy. In the name of Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. We want to pray. Well.